Good morning and welcome to our service. Welcome to those of you joining online. We're following the prayer book, page 101, the service of morning prayer. Welcome to those in church and those in the church hall. We are, um, I have a couple of announcements just to remind people that one, uh, until the first week in February, the um, church following the diocesan guidelines, the parish following the diocesan guidelines, no, no organisations are meeting and uh, with it we, we are restricting ourselves to, to worship and uh, in the week ahead that will be 10.30 on Wednesday morning a service of Holy Communion and then 11 o'clock next Sunday a service of morning prayer and you're most welcome to attend. That means in the week ahead uh, there won't be a vestry meeting on Tuesday night, there won't be Mother's Union on Thursday night and uh, the other, the flower crop, the, the fellow friendship group and the craft group who haven't been meeting, they won't meet either. And all will resume in the first week in February. So let's uh, now turn to, to worship and uh, stand together in the hall and in church as we share together in the words of the greeting. Let's stand together. <coughs> the Lord be with you. And also with you. A sentence uh, from scripture. Isaiah 55 and verse 6 reads, Seek the Lord while he may be found, call on him while he is near. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 479, Go Tell It on the Mount. Through our own 
found fault in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 62, verses 1 to 5. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet. Till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like the blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendour in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hephzibah and your land Beulah, for the Lord will take delight in you and your land will be married. As a young man marries a young woman, so will your Builder marry you, as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will you rejoice, so will your God rejoice over you. This is the word of the Lord. And Thanks be to God. God. And our psalm this morning is Psalm 36, and we read verses 5 to 10. So I'd ask you to stand with me and as we read together the appointed psalm for this Sunday. And we begin with the refrain, with you, with you, O oh God, is the well of life. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens, and your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness stands like the strong mountains, your justice like the great peak. You, Lord, shall save both man and beast. How precious is your loving mercy, O oh God. All mortal flesh shall take refuge under the shadow of your wings. They shall be satisfied with the abundance of your house. They shall drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the well of life, and in your light shall we see light. O continue your loving kindness to those who know you, and your righteousness to those who are true of heart. With you, O God, is the well of life. O God, the well of life, make us bright with wisdom, that we may be lightened with the knowledge of your glory in the face of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You please be seated as John reads our sermon. And the reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 2, reading verses 1 to 11. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do you whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee, 
was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. sing together the hymn, Jesus, Lover of My Soul.
is the happiest day of her life. Well, the child thought about this for a moment and then said, so why is the groom wearing black? Why is it that marriage so often has to have a bad press? People make comments like, when are you going to get married and be miserable like the rest of us? And the mother-in-law jokes, well, they're just endless. Stag parties and hen parties are painted as the last night of fun before you get tied down. Yet here in this morning's Gospel reading is one of the biggest vindications of marriage. Jesus attends at it and is making of a wonderful time. In every marriage ceremony, there is always at least one mistake. A young couple, very much in love, were getting married. I'll call her Jill. Jill was the wife-to-be. She was very nervous about the big occasion. And so the minister chose one verse that he felt would be a great encouragement to them. The verse was from 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, which says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Well, rather unwisely, the minister asked the best man to read it out and to say that the minister had felt that this was a very apt verse for Jill and that he would be preaching on it later in the service. But the best man was not a regular churchgoer and so he did not know the difference between the Gospel of John and the first letter of John. As instructed, he introduced the reading by saying, that the minister felt that this was a very apt verse for Jill. And instead of reading 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, he read John 4, verse 18, which says, You have five husbands, and the one that you now have is not your husband. There is no such thing as a perfect wedding. There are always going to be problems, some of them small and some of them large. Well, this morning, we've come to look in on a wedding that had a big problem. They were quickly running out of refreshments for all the guests that they had invited to the party. And in particular, they were running out of wine. And once they ran out of wine, the celebration would be over. The joy would be gone. They were running on empty. So Jesus was at a wedding, and the people who were hosting the wedding and ran out of the most important drink, they ran out of the wine. But Jesus' mother comes over and tells him of how bad this is that they have run out of wine and that he should do something. And then Jesus' and mother says to all the servants that were there, she said, do whatever he tells you to do. And close by to where they were, there were six stone water jars which held, held, held close to 20 to 30 gallons of water. The Bible says that they were used for ceremonial washing now, but the strict Jewish laws, they were considered unclean just by touching things of everyday life. Anything that you touched would make you unclean. And then they would pour water over their hands into these jars, and then they would be clean. So now we see Jesus using these things that were filled with things that were considered to be unclean. And he fills them with water, making the water unclean. This had to be odd to the people who were helping Jesus filling all of these jars. And they were probably thinking, what on earth is he doing with these unclean jars? Well, after the jars were filled, Jesus tells one of the servants to take some out and take it to the master of the house. And after the master of the house had some of the wine to drink, he says, Usually you bring the best wine first and the worst last, but you have saved the best until the very end. It was strange for Jesus to choose those big jars that were considered unclean. 
But that is what he chose to do, to use them in all of their oddness. And Jesus does the same thing. For though we are unclean, Jesus chose to come to us in all of our oddness and to fill us up. Jesus takes something very sombre and so very religious. He takes six large stone purification jars full of water and he turns them into something for rejoicing. He turns it into wine. Surely that is what Christianity is all about. And turning water into wine which reminds me too of the wine at our Holy Communion services. You see, Jesus was not above turning something overtly religious into something that challenges what some considers outside the sphere of the religious, that being joy. In this record, Jesus created something that emanated joy and happiness in life. So why did Jesus turn water into wine? Well, the first reason is that Jesus is compassionate. He got the couple out of a social disaster. <laughs> Jesus felt compassion for this young couple that were just about to make the most embarrassing act of their married lives. In those days, running out of wine at a wedding was not a minor social inconvenience. You couldn't just pop down to Lidl or Tesco's or any other supermarket and get a few more bottles. In the first century, running out of wine at a wedding was a social disgrace. The couple should have planned better. It was a major breach of the demands of hospitality, and it would be devastating for the young couple. And notice that when God does something, he always does it well. When Jesus changed the water into wine, he didn't make some cheap drunk. He made the best. In fact, it is reported that Jesus made 150 gallons of wine. So you could hardly kill, call Jesus a killjoy, could you? Look what the master of the banquet said to the bridegroom. Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. God has high standards even at parties. And the second reason was that those at the wedding feast who knew their Old Testament scriptures knew that the abundance of wine symbolised the arrival of God's new age. We miss this significance when we read it if we don't know our Old Testament as the Jews of Jesus' day knew them. Let me give you a couple of these texts. In Amos chapter 9 verse 13 the time is surely coming, says the Lord, when the mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with it, when my people shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. And in Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 to 10, here is another. On this mountain the Lord will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of well-aged wines stream clear. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Jesus provided an abundance of wine at the wedding feast to announce the arrival of the kingdom of God. And the final reason is that Jesus is looking to develop faith. And the result of this miracle was to develop faith. In this morning's Gospel reading, in verse 11 says, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed him. And his disciples believed him. Was faith just a chance result of the miracle or had Jesus thought it through? I am sure that it was thought through. And why? Because throughout the Gospels Jesus is looking to develop the faith of those around him. Jesus' disciples were probably a bit mixed up. They had heard John the Baptist identifying Jesus as the Lamb of God. 
as a Messiah. And yet many Messiahs had come and gone. Israel at this time was a hotbed of unrest, with terrorist groups like the Zealots springing up everywhere. They were right to be weary about following any old Messiah. But this miracle clinched it for them. And on this point, I'd like to point out the faith of the servants. They took Jesus at his word, even though it was utterly unreasonable. To give the master of the bank water when he would be expecting wine would be asking for trouble. God acts when we have the faith to take him at his word. Our God is the God of second chances. The bride and groom were given a second chance by this miracle. Jesus acted out of compassion for the bride and groom, and the wedding was saved. Isn't that what the gospel is all about? Our God is the God of second chances. God wants us to have faith in him. And you know the choice, like that of the servants, is ours. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you give gifts to all your people. You give us the power and ability to do what you would have us do. Help us to use the gifts you have given us for the benefit of others and to your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. John, and um, it's, a, it's a passage that uh, I preached on at the, the half nine uh, service this morning. And um, when you, you think, I don't think there's a minister who doesn't have a story about a wedding. In fact, it's probably um, all, all weddings, there's nearly something that goes uh, awry in the, in the, uh, the day. But uh, as I said, and it's the recorded service that was up at half nine this morning. My memories uh, around weddings, the, the, the funniest one I had was when, when uh, I was in Valley Home and this elderly gentleman on the way out after I preached on this passage, and I've told you this before, but I just love it, um, he, he, he touched my elbow and said, if that, and he had five daughters and no sons, if that had happened at one of my weddings, uh, I would have been charged corkage. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, but uh, it's, it is uh, such a significant passage, uh, being the, the first of the many signs that Jesus uh, performed to draw people to, to the gospel, the good news that he was indeed uh, the Messiah. We're going to sing now in hymn number uh, 415 about uh, his, um, his blood shed for us and his, his body broken for us. Let's, let's sing 450.
in the prayer. I believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. O Lord, save the Queen. And grant her government wisdom. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness. And let your servants shout for joy. And bless those whom you have chosen. Give peace in our time, O Lord. And let your glory be over all the earth. O God, may clean our hearts within us. And renew us by your Holy Spirit. Almighty God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace. And in the renewal of our lives, make known your heavenly glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We share together in the third collect of morning prayer. Go before us, Lord. Go before us, Lord, in all our doings with your most gracious favour and further us with your continual help that in all our works begun, continually and end in you, we may glorify your name and by your mercy obtain everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. for this, the second Sunday of the Epiphany. Gracious God, your son Jesus began his ministry at a wedding celebration and through the miracle of the wine showed us the abundance of your wonderful love for us. May Jesus continue to transform the water of everyday lives into the new wine of your kingdom on earth transforming by his love the ordinary into the extraordinary. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. And Holy God, we thank you for the ministry of marriage that we carry out here in this parish. May those so blessed in marriage grow old together in the knowledge that the best wine is still saved till later, and that Jesus is their companion on their journey throughout their life together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father God, we pray for our world and the problems faced by so many of your children. We pray for all who live under the threat of war and terrorism and the poverty which comes in its wake. And today, uh, we also remember uh, the scourge uh, of violence towards women and girls in our society. Uh, we uh, have had uh, so vividly drawn to our attention in the death of Ashley Murphy in the Republic, uh, the dangers uh, in our society for women and girls. And as a young member of church mentioned to me on the way in today, 12 women have been murdered in Northern Ireland in the period since the lockdown started. And so Father, we pray uh, for uh, for all those affected by uh, such violence, we pray for an end to it. We remember uh, from Scripture that all of us are made in your image 
and uh, are loved by you. And we pray, Father, uh, that that message uh, of, of love uh, and respect for life uh, would be reflective, not only in our church, uh, but throughout our community. And we ask you, Father, to give those that govern us hearts and minds uh, that uh, would promote justice, respect, uh, and an end to all forms of violence in our society. And we pray in this week, particularly, uh, for violence directed at women and girls. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father God, we pray for those uh, we know who are married during the will be married during the coming year. And many of us will know and attend weddings in this year coming. Be with them, be with those young couples as they make their plans and give uh, them patience and understanding when things are difficult and when things inevitably don't go as uh, they have planned. In their growing love for each other, may they come to know you as a source of all love and help them to rejoice in their shared memories of joy and laughter, sadness and disappointment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And loving God, we pray for those who have rejected you because they are ill and blame you for their afflictions. Help them to see the reality of your desire of wholeness and health for them and for all humanity. Enable those who are sick, uh, enable all who are sick to pray for help for themselves and to give thanks for those who care for them. And Father, in a moment of silence, let's bring before you those uh, known to us who are sick or unwell at this time or bereaved and need us your support. And so we name them before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. And mighty God, through your Son, you have freed us from the grip of the tomb. We remember with thanksgiving those who we love and are at rest. And as a congregation, we give you thanks uh, for Aubrey Hamill's life, and we remember his family at this time. We pray for those who are bereaved by the passing of loved ones. And so in a moment of silence, uh, we remember and uh, those that have died recently and give thanks to their lives. And also we remember uh, for those for whom in the week to come an anniversary will fall. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And faithful God, as we go out into the world, we pray that we may reflect your love in our families, in our church, and in our community. And that with that love, uh, we, will we, will, uh, we will bring your values of, uh, of justice, peace, uh, and respect for all humanity uh, to those whom we encounter so that the world can witness that we are followers of Jesus and draw others into his loving care. Merciful Father, merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And uh, as we uh, go from church, we're going to sing hymn number 597, which um, is a uh, a commitment on our part uh, that we will indeed seek to live out uh, the values uh, that God has, uh, uh, through Jesus, has uh, uh, displayed so uh, so uh, clearly to us, and that is love, love that lays down uh, uh, its life for uh, one another. So let's sing together, five, nine, seven.
you on every side and guide you in truth and peace. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be yours now and for all eternity. Amen. 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 Thank you.